Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, Director of Curatorial and Educational Affairs for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we're going to be looking at some of the different task force structures and convoys. Uh, this is a video I've been threatening to do for a week or so now. Uh, and this is a supplement to the video you'll find down below in the description in which we previously talked about these types of units. Uh, for today's video, we'll be illustrating the formations using Wizards of the Coast's War at Sea uh, game pieces, which is a discontinued uh, tabletop game that they released uh, about a decade ago. Uh, the models are 1-1800 scale and uh, are all from my collection. So, with the invention of the Dreadnought type battleship, the task force was comprised of four battleships. Uh, in this case, Iowa class battleships. This would form a division. Uh, the division would operate together in a line uh, with about a quarter mile separation between each of the battleships in the division, which we can't really show here. A number of divisions would be strung together. The U.S. Navy said that they wanted six divisions of battleships for 24 total ships. One of those divisions would be fast, the other five would be at the 21 knot standard speed of the line of battle. During World War I, British experience showed that one of their ships uh, in each division had to be down for maintenance at any given time. So they came up with the idea of adding a fifth ship to each division. This way, when one rotates out for maintenance, there's still four ships there that can fight at any given time. You don't know when the enemy's going to come out to battle. And then when this ship comes back, the next ship goes out for maintenance, so on and so forth. You always have four ships in your division. In the interwar period, when uh, the number of battleships was limited by the Washington Naval Treaty, we've got another video about that down in the description, uh, because of the limited number of battleships and having still the same number of admirals in the fleet, divisions were reduced to three ships each for capital ships. During World War II, divisions were further reduced to just two ships. So, Battleship Division 7 with USS New Jersey and USS Iowa uh, was a division from 1943 to 1945. These ships would have operated together, but because they were fast, they wouldn't have been part of the line of battle. They would have been escort and carrier task groups. So the number of divisions was partially dictated by the number of fast carrier groups that were out there. Now your battleships wouldn't be operating alone. Battleships would operate with a division of cruisers screening for them. These cruisers would be uh, doing one of two roles, operating close in to defend the battleships against enemy aircraft or smaller surface vessels, or scouting well ahead of the task force to detect enemy warships. This function was replaced by aircraft, so primarily they would be doing escort work. Uh, a battleship division would not only be escorted by cruisers, they would also be escorted by destroyers. And the destroyers would be uh, screening against aircraft and against uh, submarine threats. Honestly, because we've got a battleship division here and a cruiser division, there would probably be two divisions of destroyers forming a protective ring around this fleet. So now let's talk about convoys. Early in the war, the concept of convoys didn't really exist. You had single merchant ships, and in theory, it's a big ocean. So, 
even if there's a bunch of German U-boats out there, they'll never see your, your lone ship in the middle of the ocean, in theory. The issue is these ships have to come out of and arrive at a port. So the U-boats could just be around the entrance of the port and then catch the uh, merchant ships as they were coming into or leaving harbor. So the convoy system came about where you group all of your merchant ships into neat little rows And then you can surround them with the screen of destroyer escorts. As you can see, there aren't enough destroyers to individually escort a merchant ship or every merchant ship. So you've got to group them together in a block and surround them with destroyers. This way, the lone submarine is attacking. Whatever destroyer hears can go and defend, and the convoy can reroute in a different direction and avoid it entirely. The solution to this is for the wolf pack. So the first submarine detects a convoy, uh, and then rather than attacking and letting their presence be known, they call in other submarines that converge from wherever they are in the Atlantic, and then they can all make their attacks simultaneously, and there aren't enough destroyers to go after all the submarines, so some of them still get into the convoy. Aircraft are the solution to this problem. They can spot the enemy from much further away, but they don't have enough range to cover convoys all the way across open ocean. So by the late war, convoys were being escorted by escort carriers and destroyer escorts that could provide the air cover anywhere in the ocean. These Escort carriers wouldn't be part of the convoy that the U-boats are finding. They would be much more distant, but still close enough that their aircraft could come in and attack the submarines. The convoy structure did make the merchant ships susceptible to German surface raiders, like this pocket battleship. With its 11-inch guns, it could get into a convoy and shoot it up and the escorting destroyers couldn't do much. If this happened, the convoy had to scatter and was then extremely vulnerable to the U-boats that the surface raider called in. So the British started stationing either old, slow battleships with their convoys, or occasionally their own heavy cruisers that could fight off the German surface ships if they showed up. Early in the war, the Germans sortied the terrible twins Scharnhorst and Eisenau together, uh, and one of the strategies that the British used to counter this threat, especially going into the late war, was to have a modern fast battleship, like the Duke of York here, and its cruiser screen on a distant station, so that if the two German ships showed up, or whatever German capital ships were left at that point in the war, they could move in their fast units, much like the escort carriers could be moved in against U-boats. Uh, in this way, the German battleship Scharnhorst was sunk by Duke of York, her sister ship Nisenau having already been destroyed by aircraft. Because of the range of convoy raiding operations, 
the German raiders typically operated alone or as exclusively capital ships, as opposed to allied units, which would always have their capital ships escorted by cruisers, destroyers, those sorts of things. So their ships ended up being extremely vulnerable uh, and never really had a clear picture of the battlefield the way the Allies did. So, carriers. Initially, aircraft carriers were subordinate to the battle line. However, with their light armor and very high speed, they could literally run circles around the battle line, and then when the battle line got into a battle, they would be blown to pieces if they were stuck with it. So, during the interwar period, the idea of having carriers operate alone was developed during a series of war games. Initially, the carriers were truly alone or only had a couple of destroyer escorts, uh, primarily so that they could do plane guard duty. If an aircraft crashed on landing, the destroyer could pick up the aircrew. Uh, this was not an effective defense for a capital ship like an aircraft carrier. So, you'd pair an aircraft carrier with a cruiser squadron. And one or more destroyer squadrons. So now the carrier is surrounded and protected by these other ships. These other ships, however, are not really there to fight enemy warships. They're there to protect the carrier. So they provide an anti-aircraft screen. Uh, and, in theory, if an enemy warship attacks, uh, they, they can stop that. The aircraft carriers would have fighter cover to protect the ships around them. They would have scouting dive bombers that could reach out and strike enemy surface or uh, land targets. They would have torpedo bombers that could launch torpedo strikes on enemy ships or level bombing attacks on surface targets. At this point, there were so few carriers in the U.S. Navy that they all operated individually. That way, if a single carrier is detected in the open ocean and attacked and damaged or destroyed, you're not losing your whole fleet. Uh, in December of 1941, when the U.S. went to war, we only had three aircraft carriers in the entire Pacific. So losing just one of those would have been absolutely devastating. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Pacific, the Japanese had 10 aircraft carriers going into the war, so they paired theirs into divisions instead of keeping them individually. They also realized that while there was some merit to keeping their carriers separate so that only one could be destroyed at any given time, if you put the bulk of your striking fleet together into one force, then they can coordinate easier and communicate without needing radio. So these are the six carriers that attacked Pearl Harbor. Rather than being separate, they were all combined together so they could see common signals launched from the flagship. They were escorted by a pair of fast battleships, which Japan had at that time and the United States did not, uh, and by a pair of cruisers with scout aircraft so that the carriers didn't have to spend their attack planes scouting for the enemy fleet. They were also surrounded by destroyers. However, unlike American Doctrine, where the 5-inch 38 was an excellent dual-purpose gun, Japanese didn't have nearly so good of a gun, so their destroyers weren't there so much to provide uh, any aircraft escort, and their carrier task forces didn't operate with as many as the Americans. They were there for any submarine uh, and they relied on their own uh, indigenous fighter squadrons for any aircraft support. By grouping all of your carriers together, you could also group your fighter squadrons together. They'd be protecting a smaller 
uh, area. By the end of the war, the United States had adopted a similar strategy. We had enough aircraft carriers that we could group two heavy and two light carriers together into a strike force, heavily escorted by fast battleships, cruisers, and destroyers, and then have two to four of those carrier strike groups all together in the same fleet to mass strike against enemy targets. By that point in the war, the Japanese didn't have significant forces to counter. Thanks for watching. Uh, remember to tune back in every day for more content. If you can't find it on YouTube, then check our other social media channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, we're posting new content every single day. Like, share, and subscribe, and check the links down below in the description for more content, and also for ways you can support the ship while we're closed. Uh, there's a donate button down there, which we would greatly appreciate if you uh, had anything to donate. Uh, there's also a link to the ship's store down in the description where you can buy larger scale models of the battleship. And uh, that money also goes to supporting the ship during this time when we're closed.